a job pitch. Um, this is an opportunity uh, for me, both to, uh, or both for me to update you guys on what's going on with Eli. Make sure you're familiar with the background. Since we're here at Box Club, I'm pretty sure you're aware of Eli to some extent, but um, I hope that you appreciate the details because this is a researcher-driven project. We're really trying to affect change. The second part of the opportunity is for you guys to tell us what you need. So we're spe specifically here through Lisa because we want to do more work with early careers. Having established the life as a venue for great quality science um, that's being adopted by prestigious scientists all over the world, we now need to turn the benefits of the eLife project to people who are trying to just come out in your career. So it's a part of the, the whole um, impetus for the project. So let's get up to speed um, on, on everything eLife is meant to be. So you may know that um, that the both got together, Green and Tony, at Chenelle Farms in December 2010 to talk about the ills of the scientific publishing system. Why is it so difficult and what can we do to remedy the situation? So it was really an unprecedented event and the result is an unprecedented collaboration between Max Planck and HHMI and the Wellcome Trust to have an influence in the scientific publishing marketplace. We can talk at length about the problems in the system, but let's talk instead about the opportunities. Right? The opportunities are three things. One is to change peer review, to make it more helpful. So, you know, I could quote Fiona, I could quote Hoda, sitting in the, in the room with these people. Their ambition is to create a peer review process that helps scientists to get published quickly, where the reviews are constructive and quick, and that they're not being abused or, or, or suffering vitriol and having to wait months and months and months. I know that these are outside cases, you know, it's not the case at every journal that, that you're punished through peer review, but we don't want that to happen. So um, eLife wants to make publishing more efficient through swift, decisive, and fair editorial process. The second is to use digital media in the presentation and, and distribution of results. So with all the things going on in Amazon and Mashable and you know, all the things on the internet, why are we using that at the center of science communication? How could discovery benefit from faster exchange of results and people being able to build on them more readily? Open access is another important thing that Foxconn has been a leader in, um, in promoting open access across disciplines, not just in the sciences, um, but it was open access has been blocked because when it comes to those most important papers, the papers people are most excited about, they published in the journals where they felt they had the highest profile. And those were not open access. I'm not going to lose my voice. Um, and then the last was really to inspire change. You know, the point of eLife is not to be eLife in isolation. The point is to, is to do things that other journals can do, that other scientists can do, and thus change the entire system. The greatest impacts we can have are to do with those um, that are replicable, the things that we do that are replicable by other journals and other projects. The first step in the eLife initiative is to be a journal, is to be a venue for the most exciting scientists. Science. So here it is. The eLife Journal publishes outstanding research. So one of the questions we're going to come to, come to in our discussion today is how do we determine what's outstanding? How do we determine what's high quality research? And our position is that we have the leading scientists making the decisions, then they're in the best position to pick out the things that they think are the most exciting. Um, the second paragraph here is, is one approach to defining what quality is, what we find most um, promising or, or groundbreaking. So it has to do with advancing our basic understanding, um, things that uh, have real life in outcomes already, or that have the potential to drive an entire field forward. Um, again, this is something that we're going to talk to, isn't it? But um, when we ask the editors, you know, what makes an eLife paper? It's not rejection rate. It's not 7%, 9% acceptance. It's that when you see that paper, you feel like the piece of a puzzle has just clicked into place or something you wish you could have come up with. These are some of the people behind eLife. Again, researcher driven, um, practicing scientists to make all the decisions, all the editorial decisions. The thing that people are most excited about eLife so far is our review process. And here's how it works. So again, working scientists make all the decisions. Once you give us a paper, at eLife you can give us a, a PDF, um, just with a cover letter uh, and a PDF of your paper, there's no need to upload all of your data and everything because you are likely not to accept it. Um, you'll get that initial decision in two to five days. And then um, if they decide to, uh, to go for a review, we ask you to submit your files. And then either the senior editor will serve as handling editor or they'll ask the member of the BRE to do that. The initial decisions are often done in consultation. The senior editor rarely makes that decision on their own. I'll probably call up 
someone from the board reviewing the editors to say whether or not something should be triaged. Um, then the handling editor recruits about two other people from the community to do it. We don't need that many people because these are all people on the front lines making the decisions. And once all of the referee reports are in, the handling editor opens up a consultation process whereby all of her, by those people are exposed to one another and they're asked to consolidate their comments for the author so that the outcome of the ELIF review process is that you get a clear set of instructions on what to do with your paper. And if you do those things, you'll be, you're accepted. You would complete the revisions, deliver it back to the handling editor, and they can make that call on the spot without going back to the referees because they've already discussed it. And the product of the um, editorial process, the review process, that decision letter, that consolidated set of comments that's given to the author, is published alongside the paper. And in the interest of transparency, you always get the uh, handling editor, oh, sorry, I'm telling you, that's by I swear. Um, <laughs> you get the name of um, of the handling editor, but then if the, uh, if the referees also want to be displayed, they have the option to be displayed as well. And we publish the author's response, so you get a better view of how the paper might have been changed through the review process. Another cool thing that we're doing is the, the eLife events. So the eLife events is a way for, at the moment, for eLife authors to build in increments on their, their published papers. So if you publish with eLife, and you're working in the same line of work and you come up with something else that's cool and you think it's going to stand up to the eLife standards for coolness, you can submit that and, um, and have it published in addition to your paper. We call that the research events. It could be a single experiment, it could be three or four figures, it could be 1,500 words. So it's, um, it's publishable quickly, right? If you're working along one line, you don't want to wait for that full story with those two years for the, the full story to come together, but it's a novel, you can publish it. You can get it, um, a citable object more quickly, get credit more quickly for something that you're working on. Um, I want to be cool if um, other people can build on eLife stories, or if eLife became a platform for people to come and papers that on elsewhere. That they could then narrative and their threads that we can weave together. So that's where we're at for now. So I'm, I'm talking quickly, I know, I just want to bring you up to speed. I welcome your questions and your interrogations on all of these different things. But we're here to talk about what we do next. And so, as you might expect, um, as we go forward, um, the barrier that we face along with you um, is research assessment. And research assessment based on impact factors. So here's what we're doing about that. Very early on, I think this might have been last summer, you know, we only started publishing in December 2012, so just as soon as we can, could, we pulled out an editorial to say, we don't support this, we will never support this ever. So um, here's a, just an excerpt from that editorial with uh, Randy Mark, uh, Fiona, and Dutla saying, we just will not support it. It details all the flaws, it details all the missed opportunities of using the impact factor and makes a firm commitment not to use it. We also signed the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. Dora um, calls on funders and, and scientists and you know, everyone in a position to make a decision to look at a broader suite of metrics and to challenge the way they were um, relying on it, on impact factor. So there are 12,000 signatories now. I think that must be out of date. I think there are a lot more. And it's from institutions and individuals, everyone calling for change. We think what's missing, and we may agree, is what do we do instead? Right? We're not using that nice little proxy, that nice little number, what can we use instead? So when I bring these comments to early career researchers, they often say, that's nice, but I can't afford that type of risk. I need to make a name for myself, I need the dependability of the reputation of nature of science. What can I do? And I say, take faith, because the people behind you life are among the most accomplished individuals in your fields, and they're saying, we're not doing this for ourselves. We haven't designed email to advance our own careers. We already have all the kudos that we need. We're doing it for our students and for our trainees. So here are a couple of things that, that we're doing now. Um, for early career researchers who feel like they're going out on a limb, one of our senior editors will write a letter of recommendation. So if you're accepted by eLife and you identify yourself as someone who could, who could use a boost, then if you are not the right person, or Detlef or Ian Baldwin, they will write a letter. They'll work with the referees on the paper, get the substance, and they will sign a letter for you. We also sponsor, um, or we pretender, we say, um, researchers published in eLife to travel to HHMI meetings, Mott's Hunt meetings, or Welcome Trust meetings. You may know that these are closed gatherings. We will sponsor you to go and present your work there so that these folks can take a peek. 
We do interviews and podcasts. Again, um, the Heinen Lab uh, was a part of our Twitter takeover, which we did because um, <coughs> it, you know, it was cool. It's going to be a great social media thing, but it turned out to be a real opportunity to showcase individuals in different labs all over the world and to take a peek and see what's it like to work in this building, actually. Um, and um, we talked to you. So you know we're, we're, we're here to talk about how we can help, how we can help people get the recognition that they need to begin to wear down that system that depends on the limiting factors. That all said, we know, we know it's about culture change. We know that. We know that the funders have to start asking different questions when they're evaluating your package. We know that it's scientists in those on those committees who need to be approaching things differently. So Randy. Um, has made this statement in The Guardian. You know, he puts his own medal behind it. Uh, he won't um, publish anywhere but Eli now, and he's encouraging everyone else to do the same. It's not because we want to replace other journal names with the Eli name. It's because we're trying to do something different. We're trying to do it from the inside. So we're not saying publish with Eli instead of that other high profile journal. We're saying value the credibility and quality of your own work because the scientist is telling you it is, and we will back you up no matter how well known Eli is among your colleagues. And finally, uh, we've recruited some, some early career advisors to help us out. So I'm opening a door to you here. I do hope that you'll tell me how to contact you and that you'll contact me because we need to know what people value and what types of behaviors we can begin to recognize to change the system. Right? So we're talking to the most accomplished scientists in the world. They're working with us and they're saying, yeah, we agree. We agree and we're, gonna, we're willing to take that to our, our review committee. But then what can we tell them to do differently? Help us, to help us to shape what happens next. And uh, that is all I'm going to say. So thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, talk at this very nice uh, panel discussion. Um, so I'm a postdoc, and I uh, well, recently had the chance to publish Eli. It was a very good experience. I will not be taking a uh, talking many details about that, but I'm willing to answer any questions about it. So um, rather I would like to, to maybe express what it might feel for a, a senior poster or somebody that is preparing to go into the, uh, into the, uh, the shark infested waters of finding a job uh, as an independent job. I feel like I'm trying to choose where you are, when and where you are going to send uh, your, your years of work to be evaluated and then uh, maybe make a career a decision after that. And it is very exciting to be uh, witnessing and maybe even to be a part of changes in, in the way uh, scientific uh, research is published and access, like open access and different types of evaluations that journals are trying out, for example, we like. How do you feel when you, when you have to make that decision? I mean, and usually uh, I think uh, when when you're part of an, you feel basically like a, like you're part of, part of an experiment, right? And it's, it's a, a little bit of a of a of karma maybe that that you are now being the, the experimental subject and 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 where in, in taking that decision. And nevertheless, uh, I I wouldn't change it. I think it's a great opportunity to be to be uh, to be to be facing this and, and to be trying to, uh, to move forward with that. And uh, one thing I I think that we can all we can all we can all wish for when we're, we're when we're trying to uh, move forward in our career and, and, and maybe that's what the Eli is trying to do is is there's a few things that, that I, I guess uh, that most of us would want and is it is uh, I've just I've just written down a few ideas here and you can of course add many more but I think transparency is one of them I think we all want to be more informed on how decisions are made why a paper is published, or why somebody uh, might or might not be hired. So, so transparency in, in the publishing and the evaluation thing is something I think is very central uh, to us. Um, another thing is that is to ensure that the quality of the work that is being submitted or evaluated is really going to be assessed by somebody that is capable of doing that, so somebody is competent, and the decision whether your paper is going to go through or where you're going to get a, a position or not is not going to be taken uh, lightly. And sometimes one has the impression that maybe the decision is being taken lightly. So, 
So we need the quality of assessment is one of the central things. We also need a commitment, I think, from uh, from from committees and so on, uh, <coughs> committees and, and uh, career committees that they are going to do this and not just that they are, oh yeah, we like that and so on, but that they actually commit to using uh, uh, qualitative measures of your research, of your proposal and so on to move forward in, in your career. Um, so uh, the question is, of course, is eLife uh, one of the alternatives to do that is either moving in that in that direction or facilitating that. I personally think that the start is is, is very good. It just looks very nice. Uh, I had a, a good experience with that, and uh, I would encourage others to make their own opinion and and, and, and have a look at it and, and judge by themselves. But I think it is definitely worth having a look at this and maybe also other initiatives to demystify and and, and make. Uh, uh, this process more open and, and therefore more understandable and how and more targetable. How can I target uh, being published in a, in, in a great journal? How can I really target uh, being hired in a great institution? And for that, we just need all the information as transparently as we can and the maximum quality that is demanded of us. We are demanded to produce high quality research to the biggest and highest standards. Well, we demand back. Uh, that our research is evaluated with the highest, by the highest standards of people and with the highest standards possible. So it has to be a two-way. You know, it's a great research, but poor evaluation. Okay. I am not a person, but a junior uh, group leader, and um, I. <coughs> Well, actually, our second paper we published in uh, in Ila, so this is probably also why I am here. And so um, I also have to say that actually this experience was, um, yeah, pretty good. So I had a also quite good experience uh, with this journal. And I mean, we all know that the, the single most annoying thing about being a scientist is really publishing, right? I mean, the, the science is a lot of fun. But then you have to write up the paper, and actually this is already where the pain begins, right? And then you send your paper out, and, and, and you get all these ridiculous, you know, things that you have to do, right? And, and I think really the, the single most, um, yeah, best thing that, that Eli came up with is this streamlined um, review process. So really that you have a dialogue of uh, the editor and maybe the two to three reviewers, and they really talk about the work. I think this is really something that all journals should adapt. I think this is really, because it's also a very good control mechanism to really, um, yeah, prevent this, this uh, bullshit from happening that very often actually happens. And so I, I really think this, this, is, uh, this is key. Uh, this dialogue. And then, uh, of course, I mean, ELAP is also open access and there are no fees. I mean, this is also a very important thing, I think, uh, nowadays that uh, things are that publish, uh, should be accessible to everyone. Um, it's also very fast. So, I mean, for me as a uh, junior scientist, I mean, you know, you don't maybe have the time to wait a year or so until you think or so, or maybe even two years. I mean, there are all these stories out there, right? And so you really, I mean, uh, you need to get your paper out fast. Also, you need to have visibility. That's a very important thing for you as a junior scientist is to be visible to the community. People need to know you. People need to know that you're out there, right? And so I, I think also with this, you know, can, uh, can help a lot. Um, one thing that I also appreciate about you know, is um, that um, there is no uh, size limit, I think. So, so, so really, you can, if you think you have a lot to say, you know, self, for example, squeezes you into these uh, this seven figure format or uh, nature into four figures, but with Elite, I mean, you can really, you know, say much more. I think this is also a big advantage. Um, but there are also things that I'm a little worried about. Um, and so one thing is, again, I mean, so this journal is, is, is run by scientists. So I think this is something that is good because I'd rather have a journal run by scientists than by, um, you know, professional editors. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's the, same, the same people again, right? It's these elite scientists who are, you know, you know, deciding, right? And so 
they're already doing this for nature, for science, for cell. It's the same people again. And that is something I'm a little bit worried about. Um, so, but I don't, also, I mean, on the other hand, I mean, there has to be peer review, I think, and these people are very experienced. So I don't, <coughs> I don't see, I mean, I don't know, maybe we can discuss, discuss this. And, um, yeah, I mean, the other issue also, I mean, I guess now that you know, is getting more and more, um, yeah, papers also uh, being submitted, this maybe um, can actually, these scientists which have not much time at their hands, can they even, I mean, are they even able to handle all this load of, uh, you know, submitted articles that are not coming in? So I'm also worried a little bit whether the uh, review process can be maintained as good as, good. I mean, right now I think it's still very good, but maybe, you know, two years from now, it, 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 it will be very difficult to keep that up uh, because you, you need time for this. You know, it, it takes at least half a day to a day to really understand and read a paper, and that's a lot of time. And, and these senior scientists usually don't have that. So um, that's actually um, all I wanted to say, and um, you know, then maybe pass on to me. So about two and a half years, I went to Washington, D.C. with uh, Herbie Ede, who was the vice president of the time, to a very interesting meeting, usually in farm, to discuss the future of publication. As you all know, young people in this room, the most frustrating thing is everybody complains about the publication process. Why are the senior scientists not doing anything about it? And it also goes, how do you do something about it? It's such a delocalized problem with all the different journals and review process institutes. There's no central authority that can say, don't care about cell paper. It's a culture, not a reality. And then when this great idea came up, the, the Max Plum and the Welcome and how you said, we put a lot of money in research. Why don't we put money into research and publication? And it's a tiny percentage of budget going into that, which is making this free publication process in your life. And providing the money to allow you might to think about how to do things differently. The decision that we made in uh, Gina Farm were initially quite radical, but then we were toned down um, with the realities of the situation, which was, came up with the on about that scale of the new problem. And we had an initial idea. Let's be like a newspaper. So how does it work in a newspaper? The journalists say copy, and the editors then decide where it should go in the journal. And so the idea was that by plus one, everything would be reviewed, but then the editors would decide you know, where it went in, select out the most interesting papers or their pick. That turned out to be too complicated because of the flood of the Simon Porter. How do you keep a, a good process? But what we did identify was the problem was that the professional editors can no longer make the decisions necessary to judge the difficulty of modern experiments. They're so complicated that they are no longer able to do it, and they're mostly been on the bench for too long. So we all know what happens. Three reviewers in different parts of the world read a paper on a rainy Sunday afternoon, or they might give them a postdoc and a few corrections. It goes back. The editor's completely incapable of judging it, and they send it back to you, and you have to work out what to do. And it's like reading a polyphero of tea leaves in the old days. You know, what does this word mean? What does that sentence mean? And so the streamlined editorial process that you know, I came up with has been an absolutely superb development because I'm really enjoying myself doing the part of it, which is that we chat online about the paper when we come up with a consensus. And if that consensus can be met by the, by the, uh, by the authors, then put their culture. And crucially, we will not ask for anything that takes more than two months to do. So there's none of this business of come back when you've got a crystal structure or the thing that should just one time. <laughs> just saying, well, we've yeah. seen all of us. You know, that's not a joke, come back with a mouse model and you can keep it. And so that, I think, will encourage scientists again to submit complete papers. Because what I'm saying about papers all the time, saying it's very nice, but what's complete? The complete papers come in from good people, they get published, and, uh, and, then, and then we move on to the next stage. So I think that's been a good thing about publication, and it stops the vitriol, because I, of course, don't let vitriol get reviews through. And, I just, and Kai actually told me when he was editor of KCB, he actually did the same thing, you know, which is not done these days. Because 
Why have the jumps on Robert's example is why do you have three reviewers in the old days and not two? So you can have an average. If there are two positive and one negative ones, you've got published. That's how it was, it's obvious. But now you've got to meet all the reviewers. That's impossible. So this business of coming up with a sort of summary statement where you, and you'll, you know, it's amazing, you know, in these reviews, some of you write some very strong trench on review. The other two will say, do you really mean that? Oh, maybe I didn't. That's true when you think about it. <laughs> and all the reviewers, you might have spent six months trying to answer. You can answer very, very, you know, you get sort of taken out of the equation. So that's why I think it's been you know, a positive thing, this process of your life, of getting us back in charge. Now, of course, for any people, there's always going to be bad decisions in any system because it's just three reviewers and an editor. You can't expect a perfect process. But it is saying that it's the editors, the professional scientists themselves, <coughs> who should be making the decisions on what science gets published. Now, the question, of course, about Eli is can it break the lock of cell nature of science? And that's why everybody, of course, is interested to find out. Um, it's interesting, we've just had, we're inviting seven group leaders now for our symposium next week. And uh, I just sort of went through the group, you know, where they published. You know, there was one paper in Cell, one had a paper in Cell, one had a paper in Science, one had a paper in E-Life, one had a paper in PLOS Biology, one had a paper in, and one had a paper in Embo Journal, I think. And that was an interesting process, because Pavel, who was on the committee, made us agree before we looked at it. We would never discuss whether the journal was in our search committee part of the Dora process. We weren't allowed to bring it up. And I personally didn't even really look at it when we were doing it. But then you could go back afterwards and look at it, and you could see, in fact, some are in the top journals, some are not. Uh, and so I think the two processes that have to be taken into account are the e-life control process, you know, when we do it, and believing in Dora. And once we believe in Dora, the declaration of them and stop worrying about impact factor, then I think people will go um, very quickly. And so I'm actually very, very keen on, on e-life now. I, I, I come to enjoy it more and more. I think the scalability problem is a problem that Simon's bringing up now. I'm under a lot of pressure with papers we have to do. In theory, it's completely scalable. You just put in more editors. And it also be a matter of just keeping the quality going. The final thing I want to say about e-life, why it makes it successful, is that the problem is that reviewers are not invested in the future of the journal. If you review for cell, you don't care about cell. You just Elsevier make a lot of money through corporate print. The only thing you care about is getting your paper in and blocking your competitors from getting their paper published. <laughs> like a good relationship with that journal. The thing about eLife is that they decided to pay the people involved in it. So like Randy. This guy can make a huge amount of money by corporate consulting. Let's pay him a salary, and pay a really decent salary to run the journal, of course. I'm paid. To be a PR, I mean, we're all paid. And so we're all invested in the journal. You know, we go to meetings, and which happen once a year, as a center editors, and we say, guys, we've got to get faster. You know, I feel it. That's part of my job to make sure the review process is happening part of I'm investing, I'm paid. I'm, you know, that's my job. And you know, as a senior scientist like me, I have so much to do in life. What do I decide to do? I'm identifying the reviewers with the journal. That's another great way of making the journal work. So, that's all I'll say now. I mean, there are flaws, but uh, it's still 
you know, you should have a combination of both, right? A peer review process and a post review process. And I think this is the best way to watch papers. And that's my opinion. I mean, I was on a panel of peer review in last ACB, and that's one thing we really came up with. Is that, that allows us to support the data for the public. It's the only way. You know, if, we're post, if you only have post review, we're not judging the quality of anyone who's doing any reviews at all. So I think without it, we give away a huge benefit when we're allowed to have in the modern era. So. I think it's not necessarily having or not having the peer review, but if the quality of the peer review uh, and, of course, of the editorial process, but also the peer review is ensured, I, I don't think there is a major problem with it. The problem is that it's usually uh, sometimes not very good. So uh, as long as we hold uh, peer review to the standard that we want to hold the research, uh, then I think uh, a lot of problems are gone. Yeah. I'm, I'm not arguing against peer review. I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what you think, because there is a bioarchive now. And so some people put things there, and then some journals don't allow you to do that before you want to publish, yeah. others do. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about it. But you can, you can combine this, right? I mean, so what we did actually, we put our paper first you know, on bioarchive. This actually uh, supports that. And so it was out there, so people knew it's got to come at some point, right? And, and then we also had the Eli review process, and I mean, this combination of things is, is probably a good way of doing it. Yeah, and nature satisfies local That's why they must die. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually not true. Right? I think only so now. That's what we ask you, if you see anyone stop it, and nature does allow The other thing is how you should apply the evidence against some methods. Meaning, when you go back to HHMI, to the Max Planck Society, what are the parameters besides, you know, the number of submission or the turnover that allows you to say, look, we have published the best science in the field? I mean, what, what type of criteria do you use? Not uh, going to Thompson. Well, we have. Um top representatives from each of those organizations on our board and they're using the same criteria that our editors are and that's that they think it's great. Um, it's it's subjective to you know to this point and um, they think it's great but also their their colleagues in their fields are satisfied with the quality. I think what Jeff was saying there is that you know, we would do anything like last time get to you know hopefully in a good review process they don't say okay we're going to publish 15 pages and sell that's fine even if they were wrong. You know, it's it's more you look at the quality of the science. So those of you who look at the quality of the papers that are in that journal and ask post hoc, was that a good set of papers that Elon published this year? In the same kind of way that he was doing. Also, long term, the question is how many discoveries are published Elon, and that can only be told in the long term. Where are you at that question? So I, I, I really like the idea of, of uh, Eli improving the review process, but I'd like to to bring in actually the experience both as author and reviewer for his life. And I, I would say that there is one thing, for example, that upsets me very much. And, and I also try to, you know, I'm also editor of JCB, and I also am on the side of the editor. I see the problem of the authors, and I try to really find a consensus of opinion about review. But there's one thing which I think is really common to a lot of these journals, and I'm sorry, Eli included. And that is that when you make as an editor the decision to send out the paper, I expect that the editor has evaluated the paper and has evaluated also the conceptual novelty of the paper. So what really, really drives me mad is that I get reviewer that they can comment, of course, on the technical uh, merit of the paper, whether that is, a, you know, the data are solid and so on. But I cannot stand that they dispute the conceptual value. And that therefore what they do, they can ask for more mechanistic studies. That, I think, is where it's really the problem. And the problem for the, for the whole vanity journal is exactly the same, that the editor gets confused by the fact that reviewers are experts in the field. They come up and say, yes, it's all fine, but you know, this was done before, this was, you know, it, it is technically good enough and all this. So that's where we get upset. In my experience, in life is not any different from that. I think really that you have to define what, for your life, what is a discovery for your life? 
is it really one gene, one function, or is maybe a process that opens the field, although you don't have all the mechanistic details? Okay. Well, I think that there has to be really yeah. some way. Well, well, if I can answer that, what I said in my thing is that you can't get away from the fact that it's scientists and really scientists. And one thing I've learned from doing e-life, why are we conservative our publications? Because the scientists, we're the conservative ones. Now you can see like we're making decisions. Yes, but we are scientists. We can have a code of conduct also for well, viewers and editors. I think that's that is not what I'm going to find. But I think in the end, it's the reviewers themselves are very conservative. I think that's changing our cultures about not doing e like but changing it in places like this, you know, where we have journal clubs and going all you know, the way we assess. <coughs> right, but if e like is the voice of this public scientist, mm -hmm. that means that we have to agree among ourselves really what is we want to publish. This, otherwise, we are going to perpetrate that there will be life, there will, as it was plus biology, there will be another journal next time, but the problem will never be solved. I, I think that that's a, that's a great point. You know, if we refuse to use impact factor and we re refuse to adhere to any set rejection rate, how do we determine the quality? How do you know what an e life paper is? And, and as I said, we've come up with um, non quantitative measures earlier, you know, that we ask our editors and they say it's like a piece of a puzzle falling into place. I wish I could come up with that myself. Those are fairly intangible and we could do better at systematizing these types of qualifiers across the board and it's something we identified as an action a couple weeks ago. Yeah, um, one, one feature of great science is that it's uh, reproducible. Are there any, um, any checkpoints that you try to see whether you publish already are reproducible? Um, we, I completely agree. We completely agree. Um, I believe we have a reproducibility <coughs> checklist um, in, uh, underway right now, but we're, in the meantime, we're supporting the reproducibility project for cancer biology and publishing the registered reports and replication studies for the 50 top cancer biology papers from 2010 to 2012. So the first step. Uh, yeah, so sometimes it says that there is a bias towards the last author name or something like that. Have you seen about anonymous submission for papers? Anonymous submission, yes. This is the discussion that we just had in our hour ago. You know, it's just, I mean, you cannot blind it. You will always be able to figure out who sent a paper. It's just, I mean, really, it's not possible to do this. I think we should not go down that road. It would work. You don't want to comment on the blind, double blind business? Or? Yeah, okay. I think maybe a double blind might be a good idea, but I think a better idea still is that to get as much transparency as possible. Because if everybody is held accountable for what they're doing, they will think about really hard what they're going to put out there as a review, not only as data, but also as a review. If you are, if you're just spreading vitriol, uh, like, like Tony was saying, with your name under it, you're going to have to respond for that vitriol. And I think that is a, is a, is a better goal. I mean, double blind might be a solution, but I think uh, more transparency is even better. Okay. Anyone about transparency? Yeah, following with that, uh, how you stop friendship or political connections between people in the <laughs> So you, we can guess about science, not about you are friend. We I hope that the transparency helps to, helps to mitigate both the vitriol and the favors. You know, the idea is that by having the reviewers exposed to one another during the process, that they're not able to you know, lean in, in their friends' favor because by virtue of the fact that someone else is going to witness the process, and that that process is going to be published, exposed alongside the paper. So we try to discourage the bad stuff and the good stuff to try and get a more even discussion. discussion. You know, Tony at the beginning you said that. Uh, initial idea of what to do in reforming uh, the scientific uh, the publishing scene were much more radical, right? So I mean, what at the end, you know, I did was actually, I would call it an incremental reform of the, of the publishing. So so now that you are established through two years, you know, it's, it's an aim. I mean, are there any plans to, to continue with the reform, right? So are there any plans to at least evaluate the ideas like the reviewers signing the reviews, post-publication, peer review, <coughs> maybe even something even more radical that, that, you know, since you have discussions between reviewers and the editors, well, maybe the author <coughs> part of the discussion, mm -hmm. that you can actually defend, you know, his ideas <coughs> rather than his peers, right? I mean, there are many other ways how one can actually continue this reform, right? So I would ask you whether you are thinking. 
Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of, all of you. Uh, so no, you're, you're absolutely right. Eli's mission um, is to get out there and, and change things, to inspire change across the system. Um, and Rome wasn't built in a day. So the first step is to establish ourselves as, as a center of insight, as a center for the most important discoveries, a place where you want to go because you need to know what's going on. That's the first step. The next step is to, is to get important findings out there openly, more quickly, and into the hands of the people and the machines that need them so they can take them farther down the line. So um, we've been doing a lot of work and research into workflows and behaviors and processes where we can add value. Um, in the meantime, I can say that we, we think that the research advance is a step in that direction that shows the, the promise of where we'd like to go and that um, there is this great potential in having other people interact with the dances, not just e-life authors and e-life authors. Um, and I think the, the work that we're starting to do on reproducibility signals that type of direction as well. But um, it's a long path and it's really, really important that we take the most conservative audience with us so that we can have effect beyond um, that which publishers have been able to do to date. So, what alternative metric are you going to use? What would it be based on? And how fair would it be compared to the impact factors? Well, I think we won't get away from metrics. Metrics are bad. I mean, I think in the end, that's probably the only good metric is how many people have read it. Probably in the end, and did it make a discovery? You can only tell that in the long term. So, one thing we were discussing before in our meeting, or also meeting, with eLife it was so was this exactly exactly the same about impact and uh, well it's been a very maligned world a word of course because of the impact factor and how everybody hates it and everybody wants to get rid of it but nobody does it but I think we have to refocus it maybe and and, and think about uh, what is a real impact and we were discussing ideas about that and one of the things that we were talking about and apparently eLife is, is also moving in that direction is that in the long term uh, the, the website or the web page where your paper is, is, it, is like the seed of a tree from which you can follow all the ramifications that uh, your paper produce, either because it, it, it got uh, confirmed by other papers, other papers use it to advance directly, and hopefully uh, this you can use to trace the real tangible impact of, of a paper. Of course, it will take years, it can be done immediately, but uh, ideally, that would be that would be great that uh, you can actually uh, follow that and see well these many papers confirm uh, such and such aspects of my data. These use this result to build upon their other other data. Other papers were heavily based on that, and so on and so forth. But it will require. Uh, in science, for example, they have to be so and some other journals also have this. And for some Yeah, yeah, there are a couple of things. I mean. Um, Science majors have to be credited for their news departments, right? They do a fantastic job of, of telling the news and, and surveying the literature and telling you what's new that week. Um, what what ELAP does is, is not news, but we do do a plain language summary of every single paper. So this is something that, that the funders, our founders, said would be important, and that's to translate your very important work into something that other people can understand other biologists, research funders, et cetera. So we do that for every paper. And we also call on the authors to give us an impact statement. So a statement on the impact that can go straight into your NIH profile. <coughs> so one of the biggest problems faced by many people is when their work gets put by other labs. Uh, do you have any positions to deal with such things? Because, because personally, I feel that when you can actually reproduce the data, it's the best thing ever. But I'm, in those cases, the journal should make extra money. I just went through that. I was really interested. We had a paper coming that had been just been published in Eli and it had scooped it and we decided to publish it too for that reason. We had to send out a field view. We were able to scoop for exactly that reason we thought it is reproducing it's reproducing another paper Eli. Why didn't we publish it? Obviously if it came close enough that they couldn't have read the paper and gone repeat it. You know, so I, I agree with you on that. I, I think that you know, we need to push that more and more. It's a contemporary paper, should we? To ask a renowned you know, colleagues in the field to reproduce a key data and associate that the data, meaning the poll would be silent and the other person would say, yes, I repeated this experiment and I can confirm that the result is compatible with what we're talking about. 
I think that there would be recognition to the person who does the reproduction, so there would be an incentive, and still acknowledge the person in the first place made the discovery, and you know, make us a little bit more comfortable than we need what we are doing. I think I need to bring it back here, you know, probably because I also I think the authors, I mean, the authors are my little fans. But I also do have a citation that would go in Pandem. That would, in a way, reward the fact that they spend time to do it. We all serve pro bono. This would be one way to serve. The answer is yes. You know, the thing is that young people in the end who are doing the work in many labs are the final say so of what's going to happen. Their paper, and so it's it's you know we it certainly seems like it's not broken the back of the cell age of cyclonic. I even talked with Jennifer earlier today. I think that is a mission, but I actually don't see that as a primary mission. <coughs> Far more damaging to my lab has always been kind of published in nature cell health people, development of the cell, intermediate journals that take forever, but it does much of a war. And for what happens in the paper and nature cell biology, you know, it's not it, it's not really hitting the jackpot if one still believes it. So one can get rid of a lot of the problems that soak up the time in the lab for review process. So, but what do you do if your paper gets rejected from the lab? Where are you saying? <laughs> well, I, 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 I actually, that's kind of interesting. So I have paper. I went to see anyone once the year, I think it rejected. And, uh, <laughs> um, and actually, we submitted it. That's interesting. So we submitted it to a journal called Biology Open, which is all reference. It's a company biologist open access journal. What a great experience. 10 dates from submission to publication. Today, <laughs> I felt so good about it. You know, I just realized, oh, this business of getting things published is such a bore that biology open the site is incredibly high. It's more, one lot of magnitude citation than any other paper in the publishing show. And uh, so it was an open experience. Uh, but uh, sadly, somebody told me after that postdoc, does it count? You know, that's the problem. Does it count? So now, unfortunately, your generation has been so um, dominated by this thing that you think that getting paper published by Joe is no longer successful. You've forgotten about the discovery. And that's what's got to change, in a way, is just getting people to understand it's a little bit published, so body discovery. So I object to that. Yeah. <laughs> Because I think we have a shared responsibility, probably. I mean, our generation might be very focused on, on uh, the few letters that make up the journal's name. However, we also know that those letters and that word, those words particularly, stand out incredibly boldly when you present a proposal, when you apply, when, when you uh, are trying to get a grant, and so on. And, and you know, as we have the feeling that there is the best and the rest, and the best is very clearly defined, and then the rest is also very clearly is everything else. So uh, we are reacting in that respect. So I guess we probably have to. Uh, uh, well, I, I do what we do that all the time. I mean, someone comes to my lab and might say, "I want to publish in Nature so much better than current one." I'm like, "Why do you think that? Where does that myth come from? That me reading a, a TV is going to care less about Nature so much than current one?" Definitely not. And, uh, and I think the thing is that the, that's why I brought up the issue of our harvest thing about let's read these, these, these uh, let's read all these things without worrying about they're published. And let's look afterwards and see where they were published. And as I said, some are in top journals, others are not. So I think as long as a scientist can make a decision to get away from that, uh, so that's not educating ourselves to not care about it. Right, but I mean that's a very recent development as far as I'm, 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 I'm aware. So up until now, that's pretty much what the feeling is, is either you have a paper in those huge journals or you're going to have an incredibly hard time uh, getting a job or getting a grant and so on. So it has to go at least both ways and if not, I, I personally think that the, the senior people have to show some leadership in there and, and if that's already being done, for example in this case, then that's great and it should be done more. So, and science, the only way to do it is that senior scientists agree they can declare they're not going to publish there anymore. So, there are some labs that have declared they won't publish in those journals anymore. Like, if you got an affidavit from Randy's lab and yeah, they haven't published it, you know why, because he doesn't do it, right? So, I think that would be a good thing in a way if we can all self 
we try and do it. <laughs> well, that would be applied for a post in Elab that not had, that had declared that it will not publish Twitter. Yeah, I think so. But because the the Elab is known for just, just deny, I mean, resigning from, from publishing Hayek, I think that you will be judged anyway by different groups. Well, what is the best? Let's ask a question there. How do you go about judging your lab to the post office? What would be the most important criteria for you for that post office? How do you interested in the subject career-wise? Yeah, that's what you pick up where this lab comes. But that is totally wrong. Yeah. That is completely <laughs> irrelevant. What is the relevant characteristic of that lab for you? What would I advise all my students to look at the post office? Which post office are that of jobs? That's the only thing that happens. There are loads of labs that they publish and sell every month. And you look and see if any of their post offices have their own jobs, none of them do. So what's the point of going to that lab, the post office? Yeah. You, might, you might see that's the point of what. Yeah, but you know that it's also not realistic. I mean, yeah. in a sense that in the hiring process, as of today, still, yeah. publication of those high people are as 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 a way, right? I mean, at least to get into the group that is interviewing and so forth. So I think we need to change it culture of publishing, but also of how we hire people. How we do yeah. uh, you know, I mean, young, young, young stage researchers, we'd love, love to make the rules, but at the end, we don't make the rules. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, I mean, when I think you apply for a job, you're judged on some metrics, right? So you, I, if you come from the Max Planck Institute, or from a very famous, um, lab, then that in itself will already be a very high credit. So then maybe you can say, okay, I come from this famous institute with this famous class. Then I don't need a nature paper, people might still listen to me and actually look at my science. But if you come from a no-name institute, from a young group, and you don't have any like high-impact journal publications, then you have a problem. Because then who is going to listen to you? Who is going to really look at your recommendation letters and know what they're worth? So in that sense, I find what you said about eLife before very good, that you actually help promote um, the papers beyond publishing them, that you actually help the people go to important conferences and give these people a voice beyond just the paper that nobody might see. So that, I think, is a right step in that direction, because you can't expect someone from a no-name lab, from a no-name institution, to not even try to publish in a well-known journal. But there has to be, in my opinion, still a call of content. In a second revision, it's not allowed a reviewer to ask for something that was not asked in the first. And yet, this is this is still not implemented. That's the guilt. That's why the vanity journals are, are guilty because they still want to have perfection in that. The perfection is takes forever. We were talking about that earlier today because, it's, you know, I, I was saying that we should do exactly that. We have to get the every new BR entry comes on. We should have a site called and talk about positivity. You know, because I've been trying to, in my reviews, get across this positivity. You know, so every paper has a poor old student post office invested three years of their life. Why send back a negative review? We all have to be positive. You know, pick out the good things and then send negative things as well. So all that stuff is, you know, is, is, is good. The other thing is that uh, Bruce Albers, come back to your point, is that Bruce Albers and I on this peer review panel, he said he thought the problem of publication was the journal part process. He said PIs give their papers to post office to review. Both lots of work in the journal club atmosphere. The journal club atmosphere is to trash your paper as much as possible. You only get points if you can actually show that thing is hopeless. And so everybody's brought up on that viewpoint. And that is at the heart of the structural process. Because I often see in journals that it's very hard to reproduce some methods because that part is very short and sometimes written in cryptic language. You have a discussion forum underneath that people could directly ask the author, I could not do this, could you comment on that, that you can directly monitor on that. Is that in the place already there? There is commenting, so people can, can question authors and get responses right away if they want to. Um, people don't really pick it up. They don't have to pick it up at eLife or at any other journal. We think that um, advances should be a step in that direction. If we allow people to more quickly build on, on published work, then that should more quickly surface things that can't be reproduced. There are two problems in publication. One is speed and transparency in the new process, and the other one is getting rid of some nature side problems. I think Eli has really done a great job of supporting the transparency process. We've done nothing yet to solve the cell nature science process. I mean, we all have to admit that. I mean, I think the hope is that now it's established a forum, it will begin to use that forum 
to do it. You'll see Malaya bobbling right now. She's going to take the life or she's going to take the slide. To sell is a classic bobbling. But we never dreamt of sleeping to not sell previously. And now we're bobbling because it's so good to get it out quickly. I have a question. Uh, popular journals also suffer from high retraction rates. Do you have any uh, policy in, uh, plan against this if you become really popular in like five, ten years? Um, no. <laughs> no policy yet, and we haven't had any, any retracted papers yet. I think we'll have to deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but because you know we're not publishing or selecting papers for Sexy factor or glamour factor, we hope to be not as exposed to the need to protect papers. And hopefully, the editorial process will do that. Because, you know, when I was at the post office, we used to say sell papers at JCB paper, the last thing I want. <laughs> because, you know, you're asking that last thing to get, get published. And if you get away from that grind, you'll have less of a problem. Well, good. I think we've got some wide range of us outside. So we'll be able to have a great discussion if you want. Thank you so much.